Hey friends, it's Devin here with Make Anything, and I've just finished up my latest batch of projects, and I think there's a pretty good variety here, so it should be an interesting video. Now, you may be noticing that there's less plastic on the table than usual, and while I did still 3D print a lot of things for these projects, the common theme for today's collection is that they all involve things made with my new G-Wake Cloud Pro 50 watt laser cutter. It's a big heavy machine to bring up from the garage and there's already enough on the table. So we'll just place it in front of me using some advanced augmented reality technology. We are really living in the future. This laser cutter is yet another prosumer machine and it looks a lot like the LaserBox Pro I've tested and the popular Glowforge laser printers. But the g -Wake Cloud Pro has some pretty awesome and unique features. It's got a rotary unit and it supports the very popular open source Lightburn software. If that's not enough of a selling point, well, it's less than half the price of the Glowforge Pro and the laser is a bit more powerful. Now, at this point, I still haven't used many of the features of this machine, so this isn't a full-on review, but I will start out by sharing the quick setup I went through and some small tests before going into all of these really fun projects. Oh, and I am still calling this a cool prints video because it's close enough. And if you want to fight me on that, well, that's a weird battle to pick, but you do you. Cool prints. The g -Wake Cloud Pro is shipped in this massive wooden container. Inside, we've got a certificate for the one-year limited warranty and some test cuts. Next, there's the honeycomb bed, and beneath that, we've got the laser cutter itself. And it is heavy. So I recruited someone much stronger than myself to hoist it out of there. The machine has a nice build quality with this heavy glass door, and inside are some extras and accessories, including the inline dust fan. There's a removable tray for clearing offcuts and some ventilation slots in front, but they're sealed with tape, so maybe that's for using the machine without the suction fan installed. Also in the box, we've got a few sheets of plywood, cardboard, and acrylic for getting started with our projects. I moved the machine once more to its final spot in the garage, and the cutter is more or less set up out of the box. I just need to install that big honkin' fan. And I must say, it seems really powerful, and it stays rather quiet. The hose is big, so I'll have to do a bit more rearranging to make this efficient, but for now, let's fire it up and run some tests. I had a short moment of panic when it didn't turn on with the power switch, but I eventually realized the emergency stop was pressed. From there, I set up the Wi-Fi connection, which is pretty straightforward, besides some quirks like the United States simply being listed as America. And for the record, this machine can operate offline using the G8 Cloud professional software, if you're on Windows, or using Lightburn, which most advanced users will probably prefer but I decided to start out with the most basic cloud-based platform for now. It's pretty similar to the LaserBox software I've used before, and it certainly has its limitations, but for most projects, it should do the job. First, I'll bring in this SVG file of the cut lines, and I'll select the default basswood setting from the materials menu, and then in the settings menu, I'll just confirm that it is a cut, indicated by these red lines. Then I'll bring in a PNG file with the raster graphics, and in the settings, I'll set that to engrave. I did have to play around with the engrave settings since the default settings didn't leave an image at all, and my next attempt burned all the way through. That shows the power of this thing, and as with just about any machine, some testing is involved to find the ideal parameters for all the different materials. Here's a look at the real-time speed of the engraving with the settings that ended up working for me. I think this was actually a bit challenging for a first project since the lines for this engraving were quite thin. 
I increased the resolution up to the maximum of 1000 lines per inch, which is why it's taking a relatively long time. The cut itself is quite speedy, and afterwards the machine takes a few seconds to clear the smoke. Here's the finished fish, which I used to turn this viking into a fisherman. As I started some paper tests, I found out that the honeycomb tray isn't magnetic, so I can't hold down thin pieces with magnets like I've done with my laser box. Since then, I've designed and 3D printed these TPU pins that I'll demonstrate later, but for the time being, I tried using these similar parts I printed for my Snapmaker laser, and that worked well enough for these tests. Once again, it took several tries to nail the settings, but I did manage to engrave these tiny details, which is pretty impressive. My final test piece was just this old sheet of acrylic, and for this one, the default settings just barely cut through on the first try. Alright, so now I knew that the G-Wake Cloud Pro could handle the basics, so it was time to make something that really lets it shine. Nailed it. For this project, I used one of the included acrylic sheets, which has a QR code to automatically detect the material and apply the default settings. I still did a small test triangle, which cut perfectly, but then the full-size triangle didn't cut all the way through, which was pretty disappointing. My only guess is that the machine has acceleration settings to travel faster during long, straight paths, and that led to a shallow cut. Anyways, I slowed down the next cut, and it worked out nicely. And it was a perfect fit for this special poly panel I designed. I ran the next job to cut enough triangles to make a full icosahedron, and while the order of the cuts seems random and somewhat inefficient, every triangle was cut out perfectly. Time to peel off a lot of masking film, and then to apply a new film of the dichroic variety. My strategy here was to tape this film down sticky side up and then spray it with soapy water, which allows me to adjust the position a bit and hopefully remove most of the bubbles. I also had a microfiber cloth handy to keep things clean along the way, but it's just so tricky to keep things completely dust free. Then I wanted to flip everything over so I could squeegee out more bubbles, which was tough, but I ended up pulling it off using some cardboard. Even so, it seemed like an impossible task to get all the bubbles out. I guess using the cheapest dichroic film I could find wasn't doing me any favors. Once things were dry, I flipped everything back over so I could use the edges of the acrylic to guide my Ulfa cutter for perfectly trimmed edges. This film is actually polyethylene, unlike many vinyl films, so I could have cut it out on the laser cutter along with the acrylic, but it's still generally not advised to cut anything with adhesives, plus I figured this method would get me a cleaner result. Though at this point, I wasn't so sure anymore. Anyways, I wasn't really that bummed because the dichroic film does still look quite beautiful, and the bubbles almost just look like raindrops on the surface, so I can pretend that it was intentional. Meanwhile, on the printing front, I had started out with these special poly panels, but in the end I designed some new panels that still snap together in the same way, but they're made to look more seamless and elegant. They've got these little tabs to hold the acrylic in place without glue, and the snaps will be hidden within the icosahedron. The idea was that they could be snapped together by pinching the edges from the outside, which did work alright at the beginning, but those connectors ended up requiring a bit too much force, and as the shape became more enclosed, it became quite the challenge. I'm using this wise color bulb to make things even more colorful, and I designed some special hardware for this IKEA light fixture. Getting that to snap together was especially tough, 
with the bulb in the way, and I even ended up cutting down the connectors a bit to make it easier to pop in the final panels. Still, I never got everything to snap together entirely perfectly, which is just a lesson to spend a bit more time planning out my design and prototyping for ease of assembly, not just the final look. All that said, the light still came out looking great. And while the color bulb is fun, the dichroic effect definitely works the best with the full spectrum of white light. It is one of those projects that looks cooler in person, but hopefully you can appreciate how wild the color effects and all the reflections are here. Well, that was a tough one to assemble, but the dichroic film at all these angles does some pretty awesome things. This design would definitely need some more polishing before I release it, but if it's something you'd like to build, let me know in the comments. Speaking of refinements, back in Cool Prince 10, I tried putting ferro rods into this tail saver for my electric skateboard to get some awesome sparks while protecting the board. It kind of worked, but the rods were falling out early and I didn't like the idea of leaving shredded plastic in my wake. Well, with the laser cutter, I realized it's the perfect opportunity to make tail savers out of wood instead of plastic. So it was time to revisit the Phoenix tail. As many viewers suggested, I wanted to try mounting the ferro rod vertically instead of the one long horizontal rod. But that meant I'd have to cut the rods into many little pieces. At first, I tried cutting the rod with this little hobby saw, but that was taking forever. I switched to this slightly larger hacksaw, which was a noticeable improvement, and nothing was bursting into flames, so I switched to an even larger hacksaw so I could cut several pieces all at once. That produced a lot of sparks and smoke, which is good fun, and a great way to test my fire alarm. It still took a fair bit of effort, but that's what DIY is all about, isn't it? To design the new tail savers, I placed my board against my cutting mat and photographed it from above. I brought that into Illustrator and drew a five inch square so I could scale the photo up to match its real world dimensions. From there, I designed my Phoenix tail using that image for reference, creating three separate outlines that I'll laser cut and then stack together. I can export them as SVG files that I'll bring into the g Cloud app for laser cutting. I started with this smaller version for my penny board, and this 3mm basswood cuts really easily. Here's how those pieces stack with the ferro rod fitting through the holes in the first two layers. Looks good to me, so I'll smear PVA glue liberally between all the layers, and that should also hold the ferro rods in place. It's pretty messy, but this whole thing will be hidden underneath my board, so it's definitely more about function than form. I used some wax paper and binder clips to clamp the parts together overnight, and then it was ready to glue onto my skateboard. There's still some E6000 residue from my last attempt on this board, so I'll sand through to some fresh wood, glue it up, and clamp it in place for another night. Here's my cruiser board version, and the process was essentially the same. I'll sand through the paint, since the glue should stick better to raw wood, and once again, glue, smush, clamp, and wait. Both results look good, so let's test them out. I brought my boards out to the epic rock spot, and whipped out a bunch of absolutely flawless ollies. I was getting some great sparks from this one, and it seemed to be holding up really well. Eventually, one rod did end up starting to come loose, and with the penny board, I lost a rod almost right away. Oh no. So, I still had some work to do. 
Sure enough, with a bit of wriggling, I was able to pull out most of the rods. So I figured the smooth surface of those ferro rods was the problem. To give the wood glue more to grip onto, I used the hacksaw to put little diagonal notches into the sides of the rods. Adding these rough edges should really stop the cylinders from slipping around. So I re-glued those holes, smushed the rods back into place with some giant pliers, and with that we were back in action. This time the rods didn't budge, the sparks were good, and the phoenix tail looks like it'll hold up for a reasonable amount of time. So I'm finally going to call this a success. Next up, we've got a project that involves not only the laser cutter and the 3D printer, but my CNC mill as well. A brilliant trifecta for the sake of creating the ultimate pickleball paddles. I started off in Fusion 360, where I could design both the wooden paddle and the handle that I'll 3D print in one file, which is a nice way to ensure that they'll work together. And since I don't actually know anything about pickleball, I figured I'd really lean into the pickle aspect of the sport. Within that same project file, I can also prepare my toolpath for the CNC, simulate it, and create my cut file. Before cutting, I used the laser cutter to quickly make this reference for the paddle, so I could lay it out on my plywood, and then cut down the piece to fit under my CNC. I'll screw that piece onto the CNC bed, make sure the toolpath is within the boundaries and won't hit any of those screws, and then I let the Stepcraft D840 do its thing. I only cut partway through my plywood to preserve the bed of the CNC, so I'll finish cutting those pieces out on the bandsaw, and then use a flush trim bit on the router to match the CNC'd edge all around, followed by a quick sanding to remove any splinters. Now I want to laser a bunch of pickles onto the paddle, but first I'll do some test cuts to find the perfect pickle. Tape generally helps produce cleaner lines, so I'll cover the working surface, and since I haven't perfectly calibrated the camera on the g -Wake Cloud Pro yet, I'm going to create this reference cut on paper first to make sure I accurately line up the graphics with my paddle. Last minute, I added some more tape since it looked like I didn't have quite enough, and I was right. Whoops. I decided to be less stingy with the tape on my second paddle, and that was definitely a wise choice. It is a bit of work to remove the tape from all these little pickles, but here's what the untaped portion looks like, so it's worth the effort. We also want to protect the wood, which I did with several coats of polyurethane spray. That keeps the lasered wood from smudging, and it brings out the natural grain in my plywood as well. Somehow, I forgot to film the printing of the handles, but they were printed vertically using Filamentum's 98A Flexfill TPU for just a little bit of extra grip and tensile strength. To attach the handles, I'll squeeze a generous amount of wood glue into those holes, which have some texture inside to help with adhesion. Then I'll smush the wooden paddles in there, and hopefully some glue will ooze out ensuring that there's good coverage between the parts. Here are the finished paddles. I think they look as pickled as can be, and they work well. These are kind of silly, and probably a bit less effective than today's modern carbon fiber paddles. But the great thing about giving gifts is they have to use them, or they'll feel mad about it. Surprisingly, those aren't the only rackets I made for this video, and this next one is also pretty unique. My nephew was born last year in Sweden, and his family is visiting, so I finally get to meet him. Naturally, I must present him with his first 3D printed toy, and I happen to know that he's pretty obsessed with a badminton racket back at home. 
So I decided to make him a custom badminton racket rattle. In the traditional IKEA colors, of course. As with the pickleball paddles, I was able to design the entire racket in Fusion 360 to ensure that all the 3D printed and laser cut parts would mesh well together. I made the printed parts on my Sovel SV01 Pro and SV06 printers using Polymaker Polyterra PLA for its lovely colors and matte finish and Matterhacker's White Pro PLA for the inner net for a clean and reliable print. Then it was off to the g -Wake Cloud Pro for the two acrylic panels, starting with an engraved logo I made and then cutting the outline. Again, the g -Wake Cloud app chose a strange order to cut the lines, but the end result was really nice. Add some M3 screws and bolts and these six millimeter airsoft BBs and we've got all our parts. Now we can remove the masking film from our acrylic parts to see their full glory. And here's what the laser engraving looks like using a 200 DPI resolution. All the parts are held together with screws, inset so they're very secure. Then the head of the racket is a sandwich of acrylic and prints filled with BBs and again plenty of screws to make it baby proof. And here's the finished racket. I think I captured my vision really well. It's visually interesting, nice and noisy, and most importantly, the little one is a fan. Hopefully these acrylic panels hold up to some toddler abuse. This toy will definitely need some adult supervision for now, but I do think I've met my cool uncle duties with this cool print. But there's more, because I'm a double uncle. I also have a one-year-old niece. She's just starting to learn how to walk. So when I found this push toy at a thrift store by one of my favorite toy companies, Plan Toys, I decided to snatch it up, despite it not being in pristine condition. Some of the wooden bits needed to be glued back together here and there, and the elastic that makes these woodpeckers peck had stretched out to the point where one wasn't pecking at all. That elastic is glued into place and it's not easy to replace, so I decided to reinforce it with some leather instead. Here are those TPU pins I printed out earlier, and they work really well for holding down thin materials like this. I started with my test cuts to find the right speed and power, and then I cut these simple rectangles for the toy, which I realistically could have cut out by hand, but I needed an excuse to test the laser cutter with leather. The straight sides barely made it through, so there were some fibers I'll have to trim away, and I did a quick suede test at the same time with similar results. Anyways, back to the toy, I used some E6000 to glue the leather to one side of the flappy tails and let those dry overnight. And then I glued the other half, making sure to leave just enough slack so the tails could still twang. Once that was dry, I tested them out and we got a good twang. And the peckers are pecking once more, so this toy still has joy to give. Now that I knew the G-Weight Cloud Pro can handle leather and suede, it was time to do something slightly more involved. One thing I've always thought would be cool would be making my own guitar strap. I have a bunch of scrap suede from my local climbing shoe company, this beautiful secondhand woven trim, and I just got this baby Taylor guitar. So the stars were truly aligned. For this project, I decided to start with a reference since I've never made a guitar strap before. So I studied this strap I had to figure out how it goes together and how long it should be. I decided to make my strap 55 inches long and it turns out that 
only one of my suede pieces was just barely long enough right down the center. I didn't realize how long the strap had to be and I was pretty much only gonna have one shot at this. So I prepped very carefully, said my prayers, and went for the cut with my longest ruler and a rotary cutter. Very slowly. By coincidence, the ruler is exactly the width of my fabric trim, so that made things a bit easier. Thankfully, my cuts were successful, so I just trimmed the ends, and I couldn't resist rounding those corners. I used Adobe Illustrator to design the end pieces that will hook up to the guitar. I did some test cuts of just the strap buttonholes, and while there wasn't much of a difference, the suede with the tape seemed slightly cleaner. So I took that approach for the final pieces. The tape also helped flatten out the suede, which was nice. These cuts seemed good, but for some reason, these didn't get quite all the way through. And there was a residue on the back that I'm guessing came from the tape. So for my second attempt, I went back to the no tape method, and I did my test cut on the exact same piece of suede to account for the variance of this natural material. I accidentally didn't record this cut, but it came out fairly well, needing just a tiny bit of cleanup with my X-Acto knife, and then some dry scrubbing to clean up the ashes. I should also mention that the exhaust fan for the G-Weight Cloud Pro did a great job of getting rid of the horrible smell of burnt leather. The pieces still smelled awful afterwards, but that eventually went away, and the cuts came out really clean, especially the backside seen on the right here. Meanwhile, I had the Chidi XCF Pro 3D printer here printing out the strap hardware I designed using Chidi's awesome carbon fiber nylon filament. This printer is basically made especially for this material, so the prints came out looking great, and they're incredibly stiff and strong as well. It's about time to sew, but first I'm going to use this X-Fasten adhesive roller to help me align the fabric trim to the suede. This is normally used for scrapbooking, but I found it does an excellent job of holding these materials in place before they're fully stitched together. All right, now it's really time to sew. I can't delay it any longer. This is always slightly terrifying for me, and since this machine struggles with the suede at a low speed, I ended up running the machine by hand for pretty much all of the sewing. Of course, this takes way longer, but it also helps me get the best stitch I could possibly hope to achieve. And luckily for you, I can skip all that. Next, I started sewing the plastic parts into place, running over the same stitch several times to make it really strong. I did the same with the second buckle, and I had my reference strap with me along the way to make sure I was assembling my strap correctly and in the right order. This end was the last thing to get sewn on, so with that done, my strap is complete. I think the result is super cool, with some nice details like these branded numbers that were included completely by accident, and I just think the hardware and fabric and suede all suit each other really well. I love that this is truly a one-of-a-kind strap, and the suede feels really sturdy, so hopefully it'll last a long time. I also used that suede to repair some handles on the guitar case. That was done without any of the fancy new tech, but I thought I'd give it a quick shout out. So there you have it. Lots of really interesting projects accomplished with the help of that G-Weight Cloud Pro. As I mentioned, there are still some other cool features that I need to explore with the laser cutter. But if you're already really impressed, like I am, you can follow the link in the description to learn more. g -Wake Cloud did send me this laser cutter for free, but I wasn't compensated otherwise, and as always, the opinions expressed in this video 
were my own. Most of all, I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something new. I can't wait to share more cool prints in the future. So stay tuned. And as always, stay inspired. <laughs>